it's Platt, and today we head to Fort Collins, Colorado. That's next to Platt's Beer of the Week. So today's particular beer uh, comes to us from Odell Brewing. It is the 90 Shilling Ale. Little background on Odell Brewing. Odell Brewing is located at Fort Collins, Colorado. Like I said in the intro, um, the, the brewery was founded in 1989 by Doug and Wynn Odell and Doug's sister, Corky. Um, the actual origins of brewing actually date a lot further back. Doug's first job, I presume when he was like a teenager, 18, something like that, uh, was actually working at Anchor Brewing. Uh, as many of you may know, Anchor Brewing is one of the founding fathers of the craft beer movement. Uh, back in the 70s, Doug worked there uh, scrubbing mash tuns. Now, today, there's a lot more opportunities out there for people to get in the brewing business, get that first job. You know, every metropolitan area has several craft breweries. You, you can go and start washing dishes or cleaning cakes, stuff like that. But back then, that was kind of a coup because outside of Bud Miller Coors, those big national breweries, there really weren't a lot of brewing jobs. So that was kind of a coup uh, by Doug to have, and he worked there for a little while. Um, eventually, Doug moved to Seattle in 1981, and uh, that's where he ended up meeting his wife. But that's also, uh, he also started homebrewing. Now, a lot of you may or may not know, homebrewing was illegal in the U.S. till 1979. So if you were homebrewing in 1981, again, you were uh, on the forefront of the homebrewing movement. And again, he'd already worked at one of the forefathers of the craft beer movement. So again, Doug was uh, <laughs> perfectly situated to uh, start a brewery. Uh, a few years later, Doug, like I said, or up in Seattle, Doug did meet his wife. And a few years later, they got married in 1986. Doug and Wynn got married. They took their vacation or took their honeymoon to the UK. And over in the UK, they visited uh, some small breweries, started talking to brewmeisters over there. And that's where it really became apparent to them that, hey, the future is us opening a brewery. Uh, so for the next couple of years, they started, you know, kind of researching, getting the recipes down, getting a business plan down, and then they started to look for a location. Well, 1989, Doug's sister, Corky, she lived in Fort Collins and told, basically told Doug, hey, look, Fort Collins is a great little town, real laid back, college town, college kids love beer, and not a lot of competition. Late 80s, the craft beer movement was just really getting started, but it was more contained in the major metropolitan areas like Seattle. Seattle, again, was one of those cities that's kind of on the forefront of that, so there was probably already quite a bit of comp competition up there. But Fort Collins in the late 80s did not have that much competition. So Doug and Wynn moved to Fort Collins, and along with his sister Corky, they opened the brewery in 1989, and actually the first beer they produced was the 90 Shilling. Uh, like a lot of breweries, Odell Brewing takes pride in their philanthropy. They give to cultural, environmental, and homeless charities. One of the things they do at Odell, which I think is kind of cool, and a fact that I'd heard years before but didn't really register until I read it researching this beer, it takes roughly seven gallons of water to produce one gallon of beer. Well, Odell has uh, worked on the efficiency of their brewing process to the point where they're they take roughly 3.2 gallons to produce one gallon of beer. So saving just a lot of water and just being real efficient, that's kind of cool. Real quick, I want to talk about Odell's line of beers. Um, little IPA heavy, just in my opinion. Uh, to be honest, of all these breweries I've researched in this series, probably the most IPA heavy portfolio so far. If not, definitely in the top two or three. Uh, again, with Doug... And Wynn being from the West Coast, his time at Anchor, also Colorado, as far as brew styles I know, seems to kind of fall in line with the California, the West Coast kind of thing, uh, hop aggressive beer. So again, that kind of makes sense. Uh, the first beer I want to talk about is one called Sippin' Pretty. It is a fruited sour, uh, contains acacia, guava, and elderberries. Now, <laughs> if you're like me, every time I hear elderberries, I think of the old Monty Python Holy Grail where uh, the one guy says, your mother smells of elderberries. So I, that just sticks in my head. Uh, the next beer is their Colorado Lager, 5% alcohol by volume, and it's their regular guy beer. Now I've talked about that recently. Some of these other breweries are starting to produce 
regular guy beer, you know, the light American lager or the just plain American lager. When I say light, not necessarily light beer, but just lighter in flavor, lighter in profile. And again, I think that's great because 10, 15 years ago, a craft brewery said, well, we don't want that guy. Uh, those Miller Lite drinkers go away. No, it's not the, that's not the way to handle business. Get them in, get them to start experimenting, and then they become craft fans. So I think that's kind of cool. Uh, next is our Oktoberfest. It's a 6.1% alcohol by volume. Marzen. I, I want to say I've tried it on some video here. I, I don't remember when. I looked through my playlist and I didn't remember seeing it here. But I know I've had it before. Decent little beer. Um, it's only a seasonal offering for them, but I remember liking the beer. And last but not least, they have a beer called Lugene, 8.5% alcohol by volume. It's a chocolate milk stout, and it is by far their darkest, maltiest beer. Um, again, to kind of describe the portfolio, that Oktoberfest is probably second. And again, a Mars and beer, malt, Ford, stuff like that, but you wouldn't call it a, you know, a big beer, you know, by any imagination. So again, you can see... Uh, how that portfolio swings. Well, before we try the beer, though, let's check out the stats. Okay, so today I thought before we try the beer, I think I think I will talk about the shilling system. Uh, no reference to Kurt Schilling here. You may have seen these beers before, something referred to as a 70 shilling, 80 shilling beer or whatever. It's called the shilling system. And basically what it is, is a pricing system they used in England and Scotland, the, the British Isles, uh, that basically equated price of beer with the alcohol percentage or how high or big of a beer it was. Uh, the scale runs generally from 60 to 160. Here in the US, just at beer festivals and different things I've gone to, I've generally really only seen 70, 80, and 90. I think I might have seen 160. But generally 70, 80, and 90 is pretty much what we see here in the U.S. I can't ever remember a 120 or 130. Just in the beer festivals, different things I've tried. Implied in the shilling system, though, sometimes is that the higher shilling, also a higher quality beer. That's all uh, personal taste. Now, it may seem funny to us, the ta you know, pricing for strength or this and the other. Part of it was driven by the taxation. They taxed beer based on strength. And again, that might seem weird to us, but that's actually how we tax spirits in the U.S. If I had a gallon of 80 proof spirit here and a gallon of 100 proof spirit here, let's say I was a producer, they tax me more than that 100 proof. That's why you won't see any cheap... 100 proof, you know, bourbons or something out there, just the taxation. They're gonna, they, they tax you more. It's based off 100 proof spirit, but if you're on, you know, if you're 80 proof, you're 80% of that 100 proof. If you're 120 proof, you're 120% of that, you know, 100 proof tax rate. So that's how it's figured out. So we do that here, just not on beer. Um, now, when you try a beer like a 90 shilling, 80 shilling, those aren't styles per se. Uh, that's just a terminology they use, but you would not see that on a beer judges list. You know, um, if you were in a home brewing competition, there's not going to be a 60 shilling category, most likely. So, uh, as far as stylistically, on the top end, on the high end of the range, is Wee Heavies and Scotch Ales. Dark, multi, higher ABV you know, plenty of body beers. On the light end of the scales, the 60 shillings, that end of the scale is Scottish ales, not to be confused with Scotch ales, and a, a beer they refer to as a two-penny ale. Now, how these beers were created, or whatever, was uh, through a method called party guile. Basically, again, this part's partly due to taxation and economic uh, reasons. They would take a massive mash bill for, let's say they were doing, I, I'm just using this example, like a five gallon batch. They would use X pounds of grain that would normally be a little large for a regular five gallon uh, brew. They would do the first brew, but instead of dumping the grains or giving it to the cattle arbor, they'd keep the grains, do the first run, and then go through the process again, do another run on that same set of grains. That first beer is going to be big, full-bodied, high ABV, this, that, and the other. That second one's going to be more session-like and a little bit lighter. But the economics at the time, 
said, hey, we need to <laughs> get the most out of those grains. And again, before they had the science and technology to really understand brew house efficiency, that was their uh, method. So that is the shilling system, uh, just kind of a Cliff Notes version of that. Let's get to trying, though, this 90 shilling. Pretty nice looking beer. Uh, this 90 shilling or 90 shilling ale, uh, technically probably an amber ale is the best way to describe it as far as stylistically. Uh, color wise, you can see that. Um, I'd compare it color wise, Sam Adams, your fat tire kind of in color, maybe a shade darker. We got a nice half inch light khaki head. All right, this is a uh, this is fairly balanced. A little bit of hops on the nose, um, even though again domestically ninety shilling it seems like a higher end. It's probably more mid range on the on the on the scale. Let's give her a taste. Oh man, that is pleasant. Uh, oh, that's nice. Enough small malt sweetness on the front of the tongue. Um, a nice soft uh, hop kind of toward the back. More almost like a cleansing kind of way though. Um, kind of cleans off any viscosity or thickness or sweetness. Just a soft bit of, of bitterness from the hops, but not a lot. And just real pleasant. Nice drinking beer. Has some substance has some hops. Uh, you feel like you're drinking a beer, but it's not weighing you down. 5.3% uh, alcohol by volume. I could probably drink plenty of these. Um, man, just a nice little sipper. Um, yeah, this is something I can definitely see sitting at a in your, in your classic British pub, uh, you know, watching a rugby match, what have you, and uh, having a few of these. Maybe a little darts, who knows. Um, yeah, that's just a nice, nice beer. Um, something you could drink out here in Vegas. I don't, I don't think I drink it in the summertime, but definitely spring, spring and fall, you know, even a nice warm day outside. Overall, really good beer. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good content. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or beers that you would like me to try, please leave them in the comment section, or you can always contact me on the Twitter page. Until next time, bottoms up.